Hi, everyone. I am here on our fifth episode of Move for a Movement with Jen Kinberg of Onstage Dance Company, director of Onstage Dance Company in Malden, Massachusetts. She's also a dance educator in Greater Boston at many different studios. Um, thank you so much for, for coming today, Jen. So glad to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to talk to you. My pleasure. My pleasure. How you doing through through hashtag twenty twenty craziness? Oh my goodness, craziness indeed, right? I mean, you know, making it work as as all the, you know, creators and dancers and art makers of the world are doing. We're we're just, you know, plugging away and and finding new ways to to manage everything. <laughs> yep. Do what we can. Yeah. We got it. We got it. We create. It's a disease. Absolutely. It's a wonderful disease. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think what's what's super interesting about your company is this very uh, central mission of offering a space for dance for adults who have families, who have careers, who have so much else going on, but like need to keep dancing. You know, speaking of need to keep dancing, um, can you speak to why that's important and sort of the the difference that you've seen it make? Yes, absolutely. Um... You know, I, way back in the day, you know, I had that, that talk with myself, as I think most dancers do about, you know, do I want to go into this as my profession? Do I want to be a quote professional dancer? And, you know, I decided at the time that that wasn't the right path for me, but, you know, dance itself, create choreographing, creating, performing, I knew that that had to be still a central part of my life. I didn't quite know how because at the time there just didn't seem to be an outlet for that. You know, it was either you go into a professional career with it or what else? What else is there to still keep dancing in your life? Um, aside from obviously a drop in class here and there. Um, so really that was uh, the reason that I started the company. It was almost, you know, I joke that it was almost like for selfish reasons at first because I just thought to myself, I really want to keep dancing. I want to keep, keep performing. And, and after I finished college, there wasn't an outlet for me to do that. Um, so that's really where it, it all started. And it's been uh, 10 years since uh, starting on stage and, you know, have just seen literally hundreds of dancers come through the doors and, you know, they all have, you know, as we say, nine to five jobs. They're, you know, they're working in an office, they're working on their grad degree or their PhD there. Um, you know, we have a lot of teachers, a lot of lawyers, a lot of, um, you know, people who, who have their, their, you know, regular profession, but like me, dance is still something that they want to be a central part of their life. Mm, yeah. I, I personally think that everyone needs a creative outlet. Or they just, I think if everyone had a creative outlet, it would be a lot more harmonious and joyful world. But that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't really imagine, you know, going to work all day, even if you absolutely love your job, um, <laughs> but going to work all day and then going home and, and just not having that creative outlet, you know, not having that community. Uh, that to me is just so essential to who I am as a person and, and couldn't imagine, couldn't imagine without it. Yeah, and you know, speaking of community, you've spoken about that as, uh, speaking with you at other points, mm -hmm. um, that also being a central part of what Onstage is all about is that creative community and the welcoming spirit when somebody else comes in, like everyone is encouraged to really make sure they're feeling comfortable, they have what they need uh, to feel welcome in the community. So I think that's that's also really important. Yes, that the word community is just so central to the mission statement and, um, you know, the process of how we operate at Onstage. Um, I've been in, you know, many different companies, organizations over the years. And, you know, dance has a bad rap, I think. You know, we have a really bad reputation of being, you know, very insulated, very clicky, very, <laughs> very snobby. Um, and I don't think that the dance community, I mean, again, that's you know, a general statement, but I don't think that the dance community, you know, has to be that way or needs to be that way or even wants to be that way. Um, and really, I've been kind of on a personal mission 
to make dance as inclusive as possible, as welcoming as possible for a variety of reasons. I mean, you know, for me, I, I grew up in a very diverse community and that is really central to my family, to who I am personally. Mm -hmm. And I really can't imagine being in a, in a organization or a community that is, you know, j just one type of person or one type of community. Um, mm -hmm. How can you create something that's unique, that's different, that's exciting when there's only one voice, right? You, j you just can't do that. Um, so I'm kind of going on a tangent there, but really uh, community has always been central at Onstage. And it's very important to me that when somebody walks in, um, whether that be our actual studio or whether it be now in a virtual setting, that people really, really feel comfortable and welcomed and feel like they have a place here, you know, whether it's to choreograph, to dance, to create, to present something um, that's really been central. Mm, percent. And it, it's almost like a cliche. How do you make friends as an adult? Mm -hmm. Right? You might not, like in a work environment, you go to work, you might know people from college or high school that you're still connected with, maybe not. Mm -hmm. uh, to have that community working together on something, you know, show week, you're with each other for hours on end, you know, that, that, that kind of um, community by, by fire almost. <laughs> That, get, that can get forged is just a beautiful thing, I think, about being in a dance community um, and working on a piece of dance art with yeah. other people. That's so true. I um, I hear all the time that same question you just asked, how do you make friends as an adult? What do you do? It's not like, you know, when you're in school or, you know, you, you share that, that you have that shared experience with each other. So this has been a really fantastic way, not only for myself, um, to gain some really special friendships, um, but to see friendships, you know, emerge from our company members or, you know, people who are working together on rehearsals, you know, for example, and then they end up hanging out outside of, you know, our regular studio time. And, you know, we try to, obviously we can't do that now given what's happening, um, but we try to incorporate a lot of social events as well into the community, uh, in, in the company. So, you know, we'll have, you know, let's meet up at happy hour. <laughs> where, um, we've had, you know, let's meet up for brunch. Let's go see a show. Let's, you know, do whatever we can do out in the community to really build that. And the best part about it is that it shows on stage. You know, one of the, the greatest compliments that we get you know, yes, they compliment, you know, the technique and the choreography and all that stuff, which is great, but um, you hear so often, you guys look like you're having so much fun on stage. And it's because we really are, we're dancing with our friends. So, you know, we're dancing with people who become our friends over the course of the season. So um, I think it shows in the work. I, I, as someone who's reviewed your company's work, um, I, I, I'd say you can definitely see that, is that um, the incredible teamwork, um, the kind of, team gelling, like a team that really gels together. It's, it's very apparent in the work. Thank you. Um, You've always been so kind with all the words that, you know, you've written about on stage and, um, and, it, and it's a challenge too, because as you've seen, you know, when we come out for our finale bout, you know, there's usually at minimum 50 of us, uh, sometimes more. So, um, fill up the entire stage. <laughs> we fill up the entire stage. You know, each piece obviously doesn't have all 50 of us, but you know, when we all come out for that final bow, thank you all for coming. There's 50 of us on stage. And we're, we're pretty enormous. Um, but still, we're able to really, you know, build that community together despite, you know, the big group. And mm -hmm. it's so much fun. Yeah. So that was a positive first. You, know, you were just saying, like, 50 people. Like, what comes to my mind is that seems like a ginormous challenge. Mm -hmm. um, just in a pure like management and logistical mm -hmm. level, um, what are some of the challenges of, of the model of on stage and how have you addressed them? How have you figured out how to make it work? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, certainly, as I said, we're on year 10. So I luckily have gotten to a place where it's a bit of a well oiled machine in certain aspects of that. You know, I'm like, okay, I kind of have the hang of this after a decade. Um, I mean, certainly, 
you know, from the logistics standpoint, um, scheduling, you know, scheduling 50 people is quite a challenge. Um, I think, uh, you know, I mean, as you've seen, we showcase a lot of different styles. So we've got everything up on that stage um, from, you know, contemporary tap and jazz, um, hip hop, pop, whatever it might be. We also have done in the past some cultural dance styles. We've had, you know, Bollywood and belly dancing and things over the years. Um, so I think one of the challenges, you know, with having a company that large is, um, I, I mean, I guess, I, especially this speaks to uh, the times now, is, you know, really trying to keep the group as diverse as possible and really trying to, um, you know, make it known that we are welcoming to, to people of all backgrounds. Um, our dancers, you know, have come from all walks of life. We, you know, we all look different. We all, you know, we all have um, a variety of dance training, you know. Um, so yeah, I think, I think just in terms of kind of recruiting new members and trying to, you know, keep, keep us, you know, fresh and, and have new voices, um, that can certainly be a challenge, a challenge, you know, to, um, to get the word out about, you know, what we do. And, um, so that's why opportunities to talk to you like this are really great to help do that. Yeah. Um, so you brought up diversity there, and that's a big buzzword in the dance world now, especially with the events of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll have a lot, some directors saying, well, I sort of, I, these are the people who show up, these are the people who catch my eye, like, how do I do it? Like, I want to have a more diverse and inclusive cast company. How do I do that? What are, what are your sort of actionables for making your company diverse and inclusive? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. It's a challenging question to answer because, you know, I'll be honest that I don't think, I mean, we haven't cracked the code necessarily on, on how to go about that in the best way. Um, I know from our perspective, I mean, marketing our company in general is really challenging just because of, you know, we're a small group. I mean, we're a big group in terms of our dance dancers, but, um, you know, in terms of being a nonprofit organization and all that, we have limited resources, just like every other group. Um, so that's a consideration. So I think you have to be really creative in the way that you have your outreach. Um, and I mean, social media is really, I think, going to be your number one go-to, right? To get get the word out. It's it's free. It's open to you know anyone that you kind of put your feelers out to. So. Mm -hmm. I think for us, we've tried to um, be really thoughtful about, you know, the kind of wording that we use, the images that we use um, to, to sort of show a good representation of our, of the diversity we already have and, and, and kind of the diversity that we want to attract and, uh, and foster within the studio. Um, yeah, I really, I wish I had a more eloquent answer for that, but, but it's still something that, you know, I think we're trying to figure out, especially, like you said, in the context of what's happening this year. Um, and, you know, overall, I guess I would just say that I'm really happy that those conversations are starting to happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm yeah. looking forward to seeing how, how things evolve because of those conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if anyone has really cracked the code or if there really is a code. I think it's it's so, it could really be so unique to each community that each company is in, um, the company itself, what dance form. Um, you said thoughtful. I think, yeah, just being thoughtful and it does take work. Um, you know, I think there are company directors out there who are like, well, they're just not coming to me. Well, you have to also go to them. Right. So it's, the, you know, it's, setting goals, it's, you know, all those kind of action steps to to make sure that work happens. Because mm -hmm. those dancers are out there. They are out there. <laughs> and they're amazing. <laughs> um, yeah. So starting to get into the socio-political realm a little bit. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about that in the sense of um, the works that you've made. Your works always have a really clear theme an atmosphere and tone. Like you go for something and it's really clear. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering about when you make something that's 
pretty overtly political. Mm -hmm. um, is it scary to put that put it out there, like uh, you know, like having people maybe reject that message, or are there parts of the process that are maybe different that you have to be a little more intentional about? Um, yeah, could you speak to that? Oh man, you're like pulling out these amazing questions today. Uh, <laughs> so when you ask that, so one piece that comes to mind for onstage that I think that you might be referring to was the one that I did um, about the school shootings. Um, so that was one that I did a couple years back. Um, and then also, you know, I have a ton of stuff that's around LGBT themes. And yeah, your show that was, you know, I want to tell my story. Yeah. as a gay woman, like, because I want to see my life reflected, right? So that in itself was a political statement to me, you know? Yeah, um, with that, so with that show in particular, so that is um, my What is Love show, which I first um, created about five, I guess it'll be about five years now. And, you know, the version that I created back then is, is completely different from what I was able to do now. And a lot of that was because I started to get over the years more brave about being more uh, open, but also more in your face about some of those things. So I think the first time that I did the show, uh, hmm, I didn't think so at the time, but now look, looking back at it and now seeing how it, the show has evolved since then, I definitely was tiptoeing around certain things. Um, and it wasn't necessarily because I was, embarrassed or, or shameful or anything like that I think it was just I I just didn't quite know what I wanted to say uh, about, about any of it um, so I took you know I took those time those years to reassess and I was always revisiting and always I have to bring it back I have to bring it back and yeah I did start to think about you know it is scary to to say some of these things and to be very in your face about it. But I felt really compelled to do that. And so it was really important to me, uh, you know, the second time around that I, I just uh, redid it, was it last summer, um, to really be unapologetic about mm. that. And so that, what does that mean, right? Um, so being super duper in your face romantic with all the duets you know they're not friends they're not best friends they're not roommates who are really close you know they are lovers they are you know spouses they are girlfriends whatever it might be and having that be really overt and in your face in the choreography and in the movement um also tackling um you know issues about discrimination and um, protesting and things like that in the, um, in the material. And, you know, I did have a lot of dancers in that piece who identified as straight. So having them come with me to the Dyke March, you know, and take some of that guerrilla footage that was then used in the show and, and having it be like, okay, if you're going to be part of this, you have to be in it. You have to see it firsthand and, and participate. Yeah. And I think that helped as well. Yeah. It's so funny you say in your face, but it's like every time you turn on the TV. <laughs> um, heteronormativity is in your face. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's so funny. It's like the ways that any of us, um, you know, straight or gay or black or white, or just these things that are, that are culture, the way our culture can condition us to think. Mm -hmm. And I think what can be so powerful about art is it's this like almost sneaky way in through story and narrative to sort of chip away at those, those structures that are built in our head mm -hmm. about the way society is supposed to look and about the way people are supposed to act. Um, yeah, I love that you pointed out uh, the, the language that I just used of like in your face. <laughs> yes, to me, you know, I'm like, this is not in your face. This is my, this is literally my Tuesday, you know, right. <laughs> but if I'm presenting it to, you know, someone who I guess is not used to seeing those type of characters or that type of story, like, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm describing it as in your face as it, as if it's like this, you know, mind blowing groundbreaking thing. And, and to me, it's just so normal. So yeah, the way that we, you know, take in images and stories, you know, if I just turn on the TV, yes, 
heteronormative, that's, that's your every day. So how do I show you something else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think with that also comes a responsibility um, of art to be intentional and mindful about those in because there is that power. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing a piece, there was uh, a suicide and there was no trigger warning and mm -hmm. all of these messages about women and people with substance abuse, substance addiction. And, and, and I, I just had that thought of like, you're not taking that power that you have here mm -hmm. seriously. Yeah. Uh, side note. <laughs> I think it's really hard too though, as an, as an artist, um, that sense of responsibility can be really challenging and really intimidating. You know, I know that, you know, when I'm doing a show like What is Love, I was really uh, self-conscious about saying, you know, this is exploring LGBT themes because it's such a broad top umbrella term. And really, you know, for me, so I started to, you know, as I'm describing it, more specifically, I would say it's autobiographical. This is my, you know, story. This is my interpretation of these various um, issues or topics because it, I don't want to be in a position where I'm speaking for all LGBT people. I'm sure the same, you know, and if you're in any kind of minority group, you know, it, it can be scary to put yourself out there and then to be, you know, mistaken as, as being the voice of your entire community. That's really, you know, that's a really um, hard place to be and you want to make sure that you're clear about that sort of thing. And, you know, I'm not speaking for everyone. This is my, um, my personal opinion, my personal story, but it is, um, you know, a part of that larger story as well. Yeah. Uh, I think you did show so many facets of what that experience can be, though. Uh, the, the piece about homeless LGBT youth uh, mm -hmm. just like was a knife through my heart, but <laughs> um, like it was educational and just so moving mm -hmm. as well. Um, and then you have a piece about this woman who's going through a divorce with her wife, and mm -hmm. um, I, and the, the dyke march like that was a whole other kind of piece of the experience. So that's a way to go about it. It's just um, show those snapshots. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's exactly how I was thinking of it. You know, a series of snapshots, a series of like, here's a peek into this. Here's a peek into that. There's no way I can tell you the entire story, the entire history, you know, in a three, four minute piece. Um, but here's, here's a snapshot. And my hope is that you go home and you type into YouTube, Dyke March, New York City, 1990, whatever and watch a clip and then, you know, fall into the, the rabbit hole and, you know, learn some more things on your own. And, and I think that as artists who are taking on things in the, as you said, socio-political realm, that's the hope is that we kind of sprinkle a little something, right? And then you go home with it and see what else you can find, what else you can learn. Right? And then donate to Human Rights Project. <laughs> and donate to everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's so interesting. Like, I often think of art as opening up those questions, right? Not giving you the answer, but opening up those questions. Because when you're given the answer, at least I know it's many people's personality, I know it's my personality to be like, huh, wait, 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 is that right? Is that the answer that resonates with me? Mm -hmm. But when you present to me the question, and I get to explore so I can answer it myself in a way that's mindful, that's intentional, that's like I've done the work of learning. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not prescribed the answer. And I think that's part of the power of art that I, I was talking about. It's um, about that back to in through story and narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I hope that audiences become more aware of that, that they can take on the responsibility of exploring the work beyond what they saw, you know, on the stage. And yeah, using that as a catalyst to sort of open up larger conversations. You know, art is the best way to do that because it's, it's kind of unassuming in a lot of ways, right? You know, you have the lights, you have the pretty dress, you have the this, you have the that, you know, there's that whole, um, 
elaborate thing. You're just taking it in and enjoying it. But, you know, there's a, there's a thought, there's an idea that kind of sneaks in there. And, you know, you start thinking it about things that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise. So art is wonderful in that way. That's so interesting, that, that idea of there's work on both sides, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of responsibility. There's, of course, a lot of work. There's a creator. It never ends. Because mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the news is always coming. You're always working on something. You got a, a grant or a press release to do. Um, but if you're a, view, a viewer, to be a responsible and engaged audience member, mm -hmm. there's there too. Um, and I wonder about steps that artists can take or companies of like here are four things you can do when you get home mm -hmm. um here's some action steps to to be involved in mm -hmm. or just the questions like right in a front i don't know like I on the director side or the company side um ways to create the awareness of that work mm -hmm. you can't force you to do anything right um, I think that's thinking that's, out loud. It's just an interesting question for me because people aren't going to they they don't think that way. Right. right? Like, I'm an audience member. I have to do work. They're just like, I'm going to go see this work. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and there's something to be said about, you know, sometimes you can just go see a show and enjoy the show and just have a good time. You're out for entertainment and then that's the end of it. And there's certainly places for that. So I don't want to knock that either because, you know, certainly at on stage we do a lot of stuff that's like, you know, it's very fluffy, it's fun, it, and it's, you know, to have a good time. And there's a place for that. And I think that's really important, too, especially this year when everything is so heavy. Sometimes you do just want to watch a piece and say, that was really pretty or that was really funny and then go home and, you know, take a deep breath. Um, but, you know, what you're saying about almost, um, you know, what can you provide for the audience? So for What is Love, it was very important for me that there was the Q&A that followed the show. And um, I was very specific about that when I applied for the Malden Cultural Council grant to put that on, that um, the discussion portion would be just as important as the show itself. And, you know, so instead of sort of handing out a homework sheet, which I also would have loved to do, um, we, you know, the space was intimate enough that we could do this, but we actually had the audience circle up. So we were like, move your chairs, you know, let's create a circle. Um, it was very kumbaya. And we were able to have not so much a Q and A, although it sort of started that way, but it actually evolved into more of a conversation. And um, I was so glad actually one of the nights that we got uh, video, we actually kept the video on for the Q and A. Uh, and, mm -hmm you know, we started to have all these conversations. There was one woman um, who was actually a parent of one of the dancers who worked in, uh, I want to say high school, middle school or high school, you know, and she was talking about, wow, our students would, you know, it'd be so great to have our students come and see this show or, you know, there's something that we could do, you know, with kids at a younger age who are, you know, who's coming out or dealing with this, or maybe they have friends who are, and, and you know, how can they learn more about it? Um, we had a lot of audience members who were, you know, gay or, or trans or anything like that and, and saying, wow, I've never seen characters like this before. I've never seen something like this. How do we get this to you know, a wider audience? Um, and, and just conversations started to develop out of those, um, those comments. And, um, and it wasn't even just about educating the audience, but even our own performers and dancers, because as I said, some of them, um, you know, identified as straight allies. And so they were able to sort of look into how they approach the work and, and what, what it meant to them and how they were able to then take it out into their regular everyday life. Um, so I think Q&As, post-show Q&As can be just tremendous in opening up those conversations and getting audience to, to think a little bit more um, closely about what they've just seen. Amazing, amazing. I could talk to you all day, but we should probably <laughs> Oh, same. Start to find out. <laughs> um, COVID, so much fun. Oh. <laughs> I like to, to ask people how you're, how you're making it work. Um, yeah. What are you learning? Like, what's maybe the opportunity out of the university? What are you doing that we can support, the audience can, can tune into? Um, tell us, tell us. <laughs> yeah. 
fourth one has been Scream Into a Pillow. Uh, <laughs> and Hashtag 2020. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Scream Into a Pillow really loud um, and very enthusiastically. And then step two, take a deep breath. And then step three, okay, now what? Right? Um, so the best example I can give is for, you know, on stage dance company, we were supposed to have our big season perform, you know, we do two productions every year. We were supposed to have our, uh, season 19 production in June. Um, but it was obviously shut down, uh, when the theater closed. So we are actually in, um, as of today, uh, we're 12 days out. We're going to be shooting our show outdoors on the grounds of the Fruitlands Museum in Harvard, Mass. Uh, I'm very excited about this. It's like nothing we've ever done. We've taken uh, 14 brand new works that were supposed to be presented in a traditional stage, and we're going to be out in the field, in the grass, uh, performing them. And so all the works have been redone, you know, to sort of accommodate for the new venue. Um, we've removed any partner work. So, you know, trying to keep distance. Um, dancers will be wearing masks at all times while we're, while we're performing too. Um, our entire season took place over Zoom. Uh, and then just in the last few weeks, we've been meeting actually in each other's backyards, driveways, you know, local parks to, you know, perform it, uh, I'm sorry, to practice it together. And it's been in some cases, the first time that some of our dancers, our new members have actually met each other in person. Um, because we've been online this whole time. So we have some members who literally just last week were like, oh, hello, <laughs> you know, I've only seen you through a computer screen. Um, so it has been a wild season and we have, you know, we had to pivot really fast and figure out, you know, the show must go on as they say, and how can we do this in a way that's safe, uh, in a way that, um, you know, everybody feels comfortable and in a way that still honors the work that we have been, you know, creating up until this point. So, so grateful again to the Fruitlands Museum for allowing us to use their space. And we're going to go and have a big field day. Um, and it's going to be on September 12th. And we have an awesome videographer, Bill Parsons, who's going to be recording all of the work out there. Uh, a dear friend of mine, photographer, Andres Calderon, who's going to be shooting um, some photos. And then we're gonna be streaming it later that evening and into the next day. And people can log on to our website on stagedanceco.com. Um, they can watch the show. There'll be a you know, little ticketing there so they can contribute for a little nonprofit organization. And that's how we're gonna be presenting our season this year. And you know, it's gonna be crazy. It's gonna be different. It's gonna be certainly outside the box. Um, but just so excited that we can still make it work. You know, just tight everything. Tim Gunn, it's the year of Tim Gunn. Make it work. Make it work, yes. <laughs> Never a better place or time to use that catchphrase, right? Yeah. And then for, for the rest of your career and your life, you'll have gained skills, right? You'll know how to make an outdoor stream performance. Certainly, certainly. I was actually just talking to uh, a dance colleague um, earlier today that, you know, streaming and virtual, I think is going to be part of dance performance going forward, right? Because yeah. even if, you know, I just said, if, oh my goodness, when we get back into traditional theater, it's been very hopeful. Um, you know, yes, we'll be able to get back into that traditional space, but how could we not do a show now where we have it also streaming live, right? I mean, you're going to... Yeah your audience you can be able to increase your revenue you know talking from the business side of a nonprofit um it would be silly not to take advantage of that so i think it, it's you know it's forced a lot of us to think outside the box but now it's just going to help us in a lot of ways that we wouldn't have otherwise considered so i think yeah. Yeah. You know. and i'm really interested to see what's going to happen with dance on film um the way that choreographers are going to innovate and just have like, because all the, the visual and sound and all this crazy stuff you can do with the technology that's out there, I'm, I'm personally really interested to, to see that. And also, yeah, what you're saying about being able to stream performances and that being able to expand access. Absolutely. Uh, also, just a quick plug, because you mentioned um, the, the new video, the dance film and video. So I'm also a week, uh, two weeks after 
September 26, I'm going to be um, premiering our virtual Empower One Another, which is a collaboration with Gracie Baruzzi of Nozama Dance Collective. And that was also supposed to be an in, you know, an in-studio performance, but we have pivoted and we're going to be showcasing dance film and um, videos that have been created in quarantine um, and some previously recorded work uh, from our local uh, artists in the Boston dance community. And so, yeah, we've been, our, you know, they've been submitting the work to us that we're going to be showing and just seeing how people have been really creative, you know, either in their homes or out, outdoors. Um, Evolve Dynamics has done some really cool, you know, I know that you reviewed their work, um, really cool kind of video uh, through Zoom thing. So yeah, really excited to see what's going to be coming out of, of this whole thing from the creative side, you know. All right, send us info, we'll get it up on social so ah. people can, can tune in. Love you, you're always the best with that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I will let you go. I thank you so much for joining us today. But actually, I should say, any anything else you want to share with the audience? We've, we've covered a lot, but yeah, thank you. We covered so the last one. Yeah, just again, heading to onstagedanceco.com or you know, finding us. We're all over social media. Um, we'd love to engage with more people out in the community, near and far. Check out what we've got going on, and um, you know, and we'd love to follow your stuff too. So let us know what you're doing and. Um, I love, love, love collaborations. So any connections that we can make with, you know, other companies, local and, and far, please reach out. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much again. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Please uh, like and subscribe. If you liked what we got going on here. We will see you all again soon. All right. Thank you. That was really fun. <laughs> yeah. Recording. Zoom, 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 zoom. <laughs>